welcome to First Local today on Monday, October the 1st, the first day of First Local. So thank you very much for joining us today. This is your 1 p.m. First Local. We're waiting for Doug Ford. He's going to do a press conference today with Christine Elliott, who's the Deputy Premier, as well as Stephen Lecce, the Minister of Education. But before we do that, we're going to go over to Weather Daniel. What's going on, buddy? Hi, Weather Daniel here with your On TV Weather Minute for this Monday, October 5th. We are going to see those temperatures rise. We're looking at a mix of sun and cloud today. We're going to look at the camera now. And as you'll see, it's a beautiful shot of City Hall and the tent on the, the pavilion, rather, on the right side. That mix of sun and cloud will continue into the evening. Our camera is brought to you by wirelesscom.ca. Check them out online. Also, you're going to see a low of 10 degrees tonight, maybe a shower coming in overnight. That's continuing on Tuesday, 16 degrees. Sun is out though, and with mix of sun and cloud, Wednesday and Thursday. Continuing on on your seven day Friday, the showers are back 16 degrees, and then we're going to be between 14 and 16 for the weekend, and some sun. Your overnight lows are fluctuating between double and single digits. Have a great day, everybody. This has been your On TV Weather Minute. Thank you very much, Brother Daniel, for that, keeping us up to date with what's going on outside. Okay, uh, earlier today we also carried a press conference from the new leader of the Green Party, Enemy Paul. So you can go back and watch that on Facebook as well. You can go back and watch the video. It was earlier today. And also tonight, keeping with politics, the Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan City Commission is meeting tonight at 7 p.m. They got a couple important things on the docket tonight. There's tax values, prosecution services, and a possible federal grant. So first, uh, they need to spend some money to appraise several properties. Uh, they're gonna spend about $24,000 to do that. The reason is, is that they have seven cases in front of the Michigan Tax Tribunal. And they, if the city loses each one of these seven cases, uh, they will lose approximately $19,439 in tax revenue. And so they're gonna discuss that this evening and move forward with appraisal for that. Also, uh, they're looking at, for prosecution services, partnering with the County of Chippewa. It's going to cost about $1,875 a month. It's been budgeted and approved already, but they will vote on it uh, tonight at the commission meeting. And then finally, the Safe Routes to School project. Now, this started back in 2017, uh, and basically they identified some of the bus routes and so on that were not as safe as others. Uh, so they found uh, several different schools. One is the Lincoln Elementary, uh, Washington Elementary, and the Sioux Area Medical, Med Middle School are all targets for this project. Uh, they need about $660,000 in federal funding uh, that needs to be approved for them to move forward on that. Plus, they'll have to do the uh, maintenance every single year on those routes going forward as well. Tonight starts at 7 p.m. and you can watch it live on the city's Facebook, sorry, their uh, YouTube page. Okay, numbers up again in Ontario today. Uh, 615 new COVID-19 cases uh, reported today. That means our seven-day rolling average is at 612 cases of COVID-19 per day, averaged over the last seven days. They did about 38,000 tests, which meant they had a positivity rate of 1.6%. That's up from 1.4 just a few days ago. We have now completed over 4 million tests in Ontario since the start of the pandemic back in March when we really ramped up our testing. Uh, There's five new virus related deaths, two of which uh, were in long-term care. And now we're gonna go over to Doug Ford. Here he is. Well, good afternoon. With the case numbers on the rise, we all have to stay vigilant because we all have a, play, a role to play. Last week, we released our $2.8 billion COVID-19 fall preparedness plan to fortify the front lines of our healthcare system. Back in July, we released our plan to get kids back to school safely. We have a $1.3 billion plan in place to keep our kids safe, keep our teachers safe and staff as safe as possible in every classroom in this province. We've hired over 600 new nurses for our schools. We added 1,100 new cleaners in our schools and invested $234 million to hire more teachers and staff. We delivered over 37 million pieces of PPE, masks, gloves, and other critical supplies to schools. We've spared absolutely no expense when it comes to protecting our kids and school staff because we're committed to fighting COVID-19 with everything we've got. And schools have been open for weeks. The principals, the nurses, the teachers, the parents and staff, everyone 
has been doing a tremendous job to keep the classrooms as safe as possible. And it's thanks to their collective efforts that the cases remain relatively low. It's thanks to all of you that the system is working. When there have been cases, the system has kicked in immediately. Parents have been notified, individuals have been isolated. My friends, the system has been working. But we can't take anything for granted. We know there are certain areas of the province that are seeing higher community spread. The schools in those places, they need some extra support. So that's why today I'm announcing more support for schools and hotspot communities. We're authorizing an additional $35 million to help schools in Toronto, Ottawa, Peel and York Region. This funding will help provide more physical distancing in classrooms, support smaller classrooms and provide more resources for remote learning. For example, schools can use funding to buy more laptops, tablets, or other devices for online learning, or hire more teachers and custodians at schools. This funding builds on our comprehensive back-to-school plan to ensure classrooms can stay open as safely as possible and students continue to learn. And I want to take a moment to recognize all the parents out there. You've been absolutely incredible when it comes to keeping our schools safe. We couldn't do it without you. Because when it comes to keeping our kids safe, we're all in this together. We all need to work together now to keep everyone safe and healthy. And if we stick together, we will get through this. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll pass it over to Minister Lecce. Good afternoon. There is nothing more important than the safety of our students. Let us reflect on the incredible strength of our plan to get kids back to school safely. We've ensured that all students could safely return to class, whether in class or online. We're also cognizant of the fact that rising cases within our community can enter our schools. It is why we're doing more to reduce the risk so that we can keep our small businesses, our schools and our society open. Notre plan a été approuvé par les médecins hygiénistes en chef de l'Ontario. Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health contributed significantly to the development of the back to school plan. Our plan is fully funded and evidence informed, and it has two aims. The first is to prevent the spread. We've equipped our boards with the funding and staffing and PP required to do just that. Well over 2,000 net new teachers have been hired, over 370 new ECEs, over 600 new nurses, over 1,100 new custodians in our schools, over 150 new EAs and 92 mental health workers are new in our schools, and over 120,000 new devices have been purchased to enable remote or online learning. Now, our second aim is to respond rapidly and decisively when cases emerge. When a cohort is sent home, we have instructed boards that they must swiftly switch to remote learning within 24 hours, and we're grateful for the swift response of local public health, working with our school boards and our parents to implement the protocols and to stop the spread. Now we know that flu season, the second wave is upon us. This province is ready to bolster our plan and to strengthen safety in those targeted schools. And for that reason, our government is acting and investing an additional $35 million to protect schools in higher risk communities of Toronto, of Peel, Ottawa and York. Our government is investing more to reduce the risk. Notre gouvernement réalise davantage d'investissements pour réduire les risques de propagation. To put these dollars in context for the Toronto District School Board, who is receiving an additional $9 million in extra funding, they'd be able to hire more than 120 teachers, or 100 more custodians, or 11,000 more technological devices. All boards, English and French, public and Catholic, are receiving funding to these targeted areas. Now, today is also World Teachers' Day, and they deserve our gratitude. Our educators have risen to the challenge. Nous tenons à remercier toutes les enseignantes et tous les enseignants de l'Ontario pour leur travail acharné. While we face challenges as a province, along the way, let us remember to be kind, to be united and focused on our efforts to reduce the risk. Thank you. Go to the phone line for questions. Ivana, I want to wish all our great teachers out there a happy World Teachers Day. All of you have been absolute champions. You've really stepped up in, in keeping our kids safe. So I just want to, I want to thank you. First question, please. First question comes from Chris Rushaway from Toronto Star. Please go ahead. 
Hi, Chris. Hi, thank you. My question is actually for Minister Lecce. Um, I'm just wondering, the Toronto Catholic Board and others, I'm sure, um, they're employing itinerant teachers for French music and gym. Um, they've recently had a few cases where these teachers, they visit up to 10 schools a week, and they've forced the closure of a number of classes because of exposure to COVID. And I'm just wondering, the Catholic Board says that the ministry approved their plan to have itinerant teachers rotate through this many schools. Um, the province doesn't allow PSWs to work at multiple facilities, so I'm just wondering why it's okay for teachers to... We have a very high and strict protocol for students in the province of Ontario. They can have a direct and indirect contact of up to 100, which is lower than BC at 120. We've asked those educators, itinerant, a synonym would be like a French teacher, for example, or a music teacher, a specialized teacher, where there will not be a teacher per class. They're usually providing one hour of instruction uh, uh, to those children, for example, in French class. The protocol requires that school boards work to limit the mobility, limit the, um, the movement of that staff member between schools, really reducing that from, let's say, years prior. We've also enhanced the screening protocol for those very individuals. And I will note that, you know, you'll remember, Chris, a few months ago, and I say this very respectfully, but we had asked for some flexibility from our teacher union federations on the issue of prep time. If we had that flexibility built in, we could bundle the prep time, we could start it earlier at the end of the day, reducing the requirement on these specialized teachers coming in, thus relieving the homeroom teacher to take their prep time. This could have been avoided. And so we're now working with our teacher unions, uh, the local is in Toronto District School Board, with their local union partners to find a resolution. And I hope we can do that. Uh, we really seek to reduce the risk. We're informed by Dr. Williams, the chief medical officer. And if any guidance or uh, adjustments are recommended going forward, we will absolutely adopt them as we have at every step of the way. Well, Thank you. Um, and I know you said that you want to avoid shutting down the school system, but I'm just wondering if there's a point at which you have to because of high transmission levels, either within schools or because of transmission in the community. What numbers do we have to see on a consistent basis um, when you would consider doing that? We obviously, I'll turn the question to Dr. Williams uh, in the context of sort of the broader uh, decision points on closures or opening. But what I can tell you is this province is committed to keeping our schools open. We have an obligation to our young people, to our society, to our working parents, to the mental health of our kids, to keep them in school. We have to do everything we can to reduce the risk. And the reason why the Premier has made this announcement today, an additional 35 million targeting the highest risk communities of Toronto, of York, Peel and Ottawa, is because we seek to avoid that scenario. We want to really help uh, reduce that risk within those communities where we've seen higher levels of community transmission. And this investment is going to help hire upwards of 400 new teachers, an additional 600 custodians. It could help procure more than 70,000 computers. And if we triage and focus on those high-risk communities uh, and improve the layers of prevention within them, we really think we could help reduce that risk. But I'll turn it to Dr. Williams for further. So Minister Lecce has covered uh, many of the main factors that are there. If you're asking system-wide, it's a different question that we've been going through the process now of looking at different classrooms and different schools and dealing with outbreaks and concerns at that level. That's combined, of course, with our ongoing issue of managing community activity of uh, coronavirus, and we continue to monitor the data basically on a provincial level, but in more detail down to health unit and then down to different neighborhoods and areas with the participation of our public health officers. At the same time, our medical officer of health, even in Toronto, they're concerned with keeping the schools open. They know the need of it. They've seen the data, they've seen the information. So we're gonna work hard to make sure our schools stay open before even getting close to talking about system-wide issues, because system-wide issues would mean large provincial activities and things far more than we've seen up till now. So these are all things we'll monitor, we'll keep an eye on, we'll be advised by our local medical officers, their data and their information to give us direction and to assess the situation in Ontario. Classroom, school, areas, as well as system overall. So as the minister has alluded to, many things are in place to monitor that, to curtail it and limit it as soon as possible. And with our medical officers of health in the province who are determined and very concerned about keeping our schools open, of course, with the safety of children and teachers and everyone in mind. Next question.
Next question comes from Randy Rath from CHCH TV. Please go ahead. Hi, Randy. Hi, everyone. Um, this, over the weekend, Andrea Feller, she's the Associate um, Medical Officer of Health in Niagara, tweeted about COVID, and she said that, you know, we should, um, if you show the modest, modest symptoms, you should self-isolate, you should get tested, you should make sure that your workplace screens, so that you should stay away from crowds, wear a mask, and keep two meters away from everyone, and she said, don't go to Toronto, Peel, the GTA, or Ottawa. Should people avoid going to Toronto and those communities I just mentioned? I'll, I'll pass that over to Dr. Williams. So uh, as far as any internal provincial travel restrictions, we have not uh, put those in place. We know that our areas in Toronto and Peel and Ottawa are having issues at this time and we're continuing to monitor that. We have asked people to, even in their current situation throughout the province, to you know, decrease travel in sense, don't go to your house if you don't need to go out, don't go moving around, even if in other parts of the province. So that's just more limiting your social contacts at this time. As far as any travel bans around those areas, we have not put that in place. We're saying again, if you need to go to a place like Toronto, Peel or Ottawa, um, that whether you was now or even a month ago, you would maintain your proper social distancing, masking, don't go if you're sick, all the things we messaged before. That's not related just to specific to those areas, especially if you're moving around, even if you go from uh, Niagara up to Waterloo or to London or other places as well. So those things are still in place. And if you do and you have to travel for essential reasons, you don't lack those uh, methods of vigilance that we've asked for all along. So again, you have to do your mask and you have to do your hand hygiene. You have to do your stay home. Don't travel if you're ill and determine what that uh, purpose of that trip is and to curtail that this time, especially if you cannot maintain any of those functions in your travel plans. So not an official one, but unofficially, you have to be very judicious about your choice of when to travel and where to travel. Follow up. Yeah, um, about the testing, uh, particularly the lab, how did we arrive at a position in this province where the labs are seemingly overwhelmed and it takes them so long to, to process results? Yeah, so Randy, uh, the numbers yesterday are still uh, up, upwards to close to 40,000, so they haven't slowed down on the testing. I think there were 38,000. 38, but at the end of the day, Randy, there's only so many lab technicians. Di I, let me repeat that, diagnostic lab technicians in, in the province. And uh, we're reaching out to uh, everything from the colleges and universities to, to the private sector uh, labs and obviously uh, right across the, the government as, as well. And then there's a shortage on reagent uh, right across the world. I have talked to uh, uh, Ronnie Miller over at Roach. He texted me this morning. Uh, but this goes back to my comments for the last couple of weeks about the uh, rapid test, the antigen test, the rapid test. It's going to be a game changer. I understand Health Canada is uh, moving forward on that as quickly as possible, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks or sooner, we should have some positive uh, news. Just just imagine, Randy, if you know you're going in there, and we we all know this isn't a hundred percent, but at least it's a good screen. If you're going into somewhere, and within five minutes you can find out you're either going in or you're going out, one of the one of the two. But it's it's just going to be a, a game changer. It's it's going to be a massive game changer if we can get this approved. And then once we get it approved, the question is, the the big companies like Roach, like like Apple, uh, not Apple Techs, uh, Abbott. Um, when can we get it? It's one thing to get approval, but we need the goods. We need the goods and then the distribution too. We have a good plan for distribution. And as for the testing uh, over the a very short while this week and next week, we'll be adding upwards uh, to another 100 pharmacies. So we aren't holding back. We're moving forward in a very aggressive uh, way. Next question. Next question comes from Colin DeMello from CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, Colin. Hi, good afternoon, Premier. Um, the Ontario Long-Term Care Association recently told the Commission of Inquiry that they alerted your government back in January that nursing homes simply were not ready to deal with COVID-19. Premier, when did you, when did you personally, sorry, that's my son behind me, when did you personally find out about this warning from the Long-Term Care Association, Premier? Well, I, I believe, first of all, uh, our guidelines came out at the first week of April. That doesn't mean we weren't thinking about it right from the, the get-go, from the time actually we got elected. 
uh, is the only uh, premier in the history of this province that has dedicated someone to long-term care, a full ministry. So we were moving forward the, the whole time, uh, right from January, February, and, and prior to that too, and, and fixing long-term care. We know it's broken. It's been broken for decades. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that we correct uh, any issues that have brought forward and that the commission's going to bring forward. But we were, we're being proactive. I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the commission to give their report, which I'm in favor of. But we have to start uh, moving forward, and we're going to continue having announcements about protecting the long-term care. Follow-up? Uh, and a uh, follow-up question to Dr. Williams. Um, uh, Dr. Williams, it really seems like the spread um, of COVID-19 is a bit out of control in Toronto, Peel, and Ottawa. There is a recommendation to you from Dr. Eileen de Villa in Toronto to restrict indoor dining until the province gets a handle of this. I'm wondering, are, are you looking to move any of these regions or recommend that the government move these regions back into stage two? So um, we had uh, discussions at the end of last week with... Uh most of it Dr. De Villa, also with Dr. Etches in Ottawa to discuss uh, how their process and then the cases and the increasing numbers were uh, concerning them. We are reviewing their data and uh, last week we did on Friday, we put in the measures that uh, the uh, cabinet had approved around restricting indoor dining numbers, the six to a table, the distancing, the watching the lineups outside in the uh, people waiting to come in. We've talked about reducing the banquet convention center down to a total 50 in institution uh, to cover that off as well, as well as we continue our methods of decreasing on social gatherings and groups as before. So um, <clears throat> I know Dr. Davila was concerned that you want to take even more extensive measures as noted in her communications uh, in that. We had said we will continue to look at that with our public health measures table. We want to see what the impact was thus far with the to, uh, processes put in place. We are continuing to ask them to give more data to make sure that it supports any further steps so we can handle that. And then looking at uh, aspects of what can they do in Toronto, what can we do, what can they do in Ottawa, and different steps that sometimes are, that are noted in our HPPA, that's the Health Protection Promotion Act, what local medical officers can do and what we can do as a province and what I can do as the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So, we're trying to put all our things together to understand how best to handle these big surges that are seen in Toronto and Ottawa at this time to give them the best uh, capability they can to respond and to deal with it in a way that meets the needs and is targeted, but at the same time protects the public writ large, uh, not only from COVID, but from other issues as well. So we want to be very careful in how we handle that, and but we're seeking and having ongoing discussions. I had another further long talk with Dr. DeVille this morning, and we'll continue to have those discussions to come up with what's best that we can help them with and we can do from a provincial side and they can do from a local municipal local health unit side. So those discussions are continuing. Next question. Next question comes from Natasha McDonald from Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi Natasha. Hey Premier. Um, at the TDSB there's uh, hundreds of students in French immersion that have been assigned English teachers. In Ottawa, French schools have resorted to begging parents to fill in as substitute teachers. Um, your government waited until last week to announce measures, new measures to hire uh, more French teachers. What do you say to parents who feel French language education, especially during COVID-19, is not a priority for your government? Well, it's a high priority and I'll pass it over to the Minister of Education. Hi there. Well, just to uh, build upon the Premier's point, I mean, it was this government during the negotiations with our French language unions who agreed to create a French second language working group, which, yes, we reestablished last week. This was not an issue as a consequence of COVID. It's been an issue for us for over a year of discussions with French language boards, parents, students about the national shortage of French language teachers. I've met with the Consul General of France as well and foreign governments to see in the Francophonie how we could attract qualified educators fr from French language um, uh, nations to come to this province and teach. We also face recruitment um, from other provinces trying to poach some of these incredibly talented people. So we are doing everything we humanly can knowing our requirement and our obligation constitutionally to French language minority uh, education, we're proud of it. It is a model in this country with very high outcomes and we'll continue to be there for French language educators. It's the basis for why we've created that working group. It's why we brought union boards, 
uh, and all parties together. And I think we're going to see some positive results about how we can work to increase supply, an issue that is not unique to Ontario and an issue that precedes the election of this government. But we know it's a problem and we're going to help work hard to fix it. Follow up. My follow-up is about pharmacy testing. So you're talking about adding 100 pharmacies next, next week. Uh, but most pharmacies offering testing, in, in the GTA anyway, either have an unavailable number where you call them or a one to four week wait list. And each pharmacy is you know, doing maybe 50 tests a day. People are still calling confused as to whether they can get tested there. So my question is how useful really has been this pharmacy testing strategy so far, if at all? And are you dissatisfied at how it was rolled out? No, I think I'm very, very satisfied. We're uh, upwards close to 100 now. We're going to add another another 100. And uh, just keep in mind, uh, you know, uh, talk about success. We're hammering the whole country combined. All the provinces combined can't even keep up to us. We have tested over 4 million people. And when we get the approvals from Health Canada, the antigen uh, test, we can implement that as, as well. So I want to I want to thank the pharmacies. Uh, and again, uh, you can go get tested, especially you know if you're you're out there and you're you're concerned, get get tested. But we always emphasize, if you don't you don't show any symptoms at all, please don't get tested. Let let the people that are showing symptoms get in front of you. Let the emergency service folks get in, in front of you, the long-term care, the frontline health care workers. Uh, that, that's what we're, we're looking at to uh, have the, the pharmacies uh, support us. And I, I think as they're ramping up, it's relatively new, they're, they're going to do an incredible job as they have, as they have out in Alberta. Yeah, the, the system's working. So we're going to continue on with the, the pharmacies. Next question. Next question comes from Crystal Oak from Global News. Please go ahead. Hi, Crystal. Hi, my question is for Premier Ford. Um, so you ordered testing centers province-wide shut down for two days to reset for online bookings. Ottawa stayed open um, yesterday with no clear communication about why, which caused a lot of confusion. What do you think about that, and do you know what happened? Well, I'll pass this over to uh, Dr. Dr. Will. No, I'm sorry, the Minister, Minister of uh, Health. Thank you. Well, the units were to be closed to um, uh, anybody who's a walk-in, but anybody who already had a test uh, appointed or uh, set up, which is happening in most of our northern assessment centers now because of the weather conditions, mostly, um, getting colder. And that's what we wanted to uh, have happen in uh, York, Ottawa, and, uh, and Toronto. Um, Peel in Toronto, sorry, uh, to make sure that uh, people, if they already had an appointment, they could go in. But there were no walk-ins that were meant to happen there to allow time for the systems at the hospitals to readjust so that they could start booking clients and people to come in online as quickly as possible. Because we know as bad as it is to have to physically wait in line to receive a test, waiting on the phone for a few hours is, is no better. So that's why we uh, made that change to allow for that transition at hospitals and we anticipate that all hospitals will be appointment to available to online appointments as of tomorrow follow up but yesterday ottawa clinics were taking walk-ins um so i guess my question is what do you think went wrong in terms of the communication there because there was quite a few clinics who weren't sure and a lot of people who also weren't sure pass it back to the minister I would anticipate it's because there were people that were showing up with symptoms that needed to be tested um, immediately. And so, you know, you have a rule, but if there's someone there that has significant symptoms and needs to be tested, that uh, they made the accommodation to do that, which is in the interest of everyone's health and safety. Last question. Last question comes from Sean Jeffords from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Sean. Good afternoon, Premier. I wanted to uh, follow up on a comment you made uh, just a little while ago in the press conference uh, about uh, the, the lab processing capacity in the province. Um, I, over the weekend, Toronto Public Health said it would stop contract, contact tracing except in high-risk cases and that their current approach...